Okay. Welcome everyone to the, um, the final session of the conference. Um, I have to announce, uh, we're we slightly running against the clock I think, and we have to conclude um, by one o'clock. So I'll exercise Chair's prerogative in uh, insisting on uh, attention to time deadlines both in the uh, presentation of the papers and in questions, most particularly, uh, particularly the draconian in this respect. Um, the session today is focused on human rights and private power. This is a question which has surfaced repeatedly in, the, uh, in different contexts, in the different debates, in the different papers that we've heard so far. Um, I don't really want to anticipate or attempt to anticipate the content of the papers. So I think I'll let the speakers really speak for themselves. I'm also aware that adrenaline levels are slightly beginning to flag. So I won't um, set out a lengthy introduction. But I'd like to introduce two speakers, two very extremely um, interesting, very distinguished speakers we have today. Uh, firstly, um, we'll hear a paper presented by Florian and Verdu on fundamental rights, private law, and societal constitutionalism on the logic of the so-called horizontal effect. Um, uh, Florian Verdu is director of the research group on um, change of transnational labour and economic law and the cluster of excellence on the, function of, on the formation of normative orders at the Goethe University at Frankfurt am Main. His research is focused on conflict of laws, industrial relations, and labour law in the EU, private law theory. And uh, he wrote his thesis on cosmopolitan conflict of law, with a chapter on the EU's labour constitution. Um, so, uh, Florian Adrodo will present the first paper. The second paper will, uh, will be by uh, Larry Katabaka, uh, who's on the Faculty of Law and International Affairs at uh, Pennsylvania State University. Um, he teaches and researches primarily on issues of globalization and policy, and his most recent works uh, consider the organization of governments uh, and non-state actors and the reorganization of states in corporate form. This seems to me a slightly belitt self-belittling description of his research, which is uh, often um, breathtaking in the range and scope and detail, covering uh, questions of globalization and different national politics as well. I think he's also conducted quite extensive, very interesting research on China. Um, his paper will have the title Hierarchical Power Arrangements and Horizontal Effects in Human Rights Regimes. And uh, on that note, I'm going to pass over to the first speaker. Yeah, what comes now will be very different from what we have been listening to the, uh, until now. And this is why my paper starts with a presentation of my general approach to legal theory. At first, by way of contrasting it with Gunter Teufel's approach. I sell this contrast as part of a dispute between the faculties in legal theory, where history, sociology, and philosophy, each of them, claims to be fundamental, or at least more fundamental, for an understanding of law. While Gunter Teutner certainly represents the faculty of sociology, I see myself at home in philosophy. Of course, to take philosophy as grounded for law, including private law, implies nothing less than to defend the project of grounding law and including private law in reason. And this is indeed the project that I'm up to. However, in contrast to prevailing opinion, at least in the sociological faculty, such a project is not tied to a sociological, nor a historical, nor a political jurisprudence, which would serve first and foremost bourgeois interest. On the contrary, to claim successfully such a tie was, in my view, one of the biggest successes of bourgeois ideology in private law thinking. It has made progressive legal thinking leave the faculty of philosophy, and this came at a high price, in particular in terms of influence in legal doctrine. However, I just talk about this hoping that I can make some room for understanding, or coming from current Frankfurt, at least tolerance of my general way of asking questions in legal theory, which certainly will sound strange for years which have been educated at the Faculty of Sociology. But I turn to my subject now, the logic of fundamental rights in private law. 
I start with a reflection on the logical relationship between fundamental rights and private law. When reading the relevant legal doctrine, one gets the impression that fundamental rights and private law constitute two orders that are logically independent. Logically independent means that each order can be understood without the other, and that there is a clear conceptual dividing line between the two. And whether this line is to be crossed or not, this is then a question that can only be answered by constitutional law. Of course, the idea that the orders of fundamental rights and private law are logically independent is wrong. It's that there is a logical dependence between the two. However, there are two possibilities. Either the order of fundamental rights is basic to the order of private law, or, the other way around, the order of private law is basic to the order of fundamental rights. According to the first position, the fundamental rights seem fundamental if one reads private law as applied constitutional law as well, and therefore analyzes private law legislation as a practice of balancing fundamental rights. Given, first, that this position is in tension to any idea of a conceptual grounding of private law, which is essential to my philosophical approach, and given, second, that Matthias Kuhn is not here, whose position it is, I turn to the alternative right away. From the alternative perspective, private law is basic to fundamental rights. This results even from the fact that fundamental rights are, in some cases, just about private law. The guarantees of property rights and inheritance law, for example, or of marriage and family, but also about association and cooperation and so on. For these cases, it seems clear that the fundamental right would not be understandable without the articulations in private law. For instance, we would not be able to understand what property rights are if we did not already know that according to private law, property right grants its owner the right to dispose of the property as he pleases and to exclude everyone else from using it. The relevant provision in private law is not a definition of property rights, but rather their constitution, and that's the sense of verfassung, but of really constitution. This, and this constitution is taken up by fundamental rights. So logically, logically speaking, the fundamental right presupposes its constitution in private law. The same structure is also to be found in other cases. For instance, obtaining a material livelihood by practicing a profession takes place not least by means of contracts, at least by means of the contracts in which the efforts of the person practicing the profession are purchased. Freedom of occupation as a negative right against the state must therefore presuppose contractual freedom under private law. For a legal order without contractual freedom under private law would not be able to guarantee the fundamental right of freedom of occupation. In this respect, private law makes a constitutive contribution to the substance of the fundamental right, which must have already been understood if one is to understand the substance of the fundamental right itself. And finally, however, logical primacy must be affirmed in the case of all other fundamental rights which do not concern, even if they do not concern or presuppose private law institutions. And this primacy lies in the fact that the fundamental rights in question always presuppose the individual's freedom to act. For example, the freedom of expression directed against the state presupposes that freedom of expression exists in societal space. In societal space, however, freedom of expression is in fact made possible, first of all, by a private right. Equality of rights and the protection of physical integrity prevent that anyone hinders someone from expressing his or her opinion, or requires him or her to have a particular opinion. This is done by private law. In the abstract, the fundamental rights presuppose private law. At least the general freedom to act, but beyond that, the more specific institutions of private law, property, contract, and so on, must already be in place for the substance of the individual fundamental rights to become comprehensible. This finding can also be expressed in a different way. If the fundamental rights presuppose that private law constitutes certain things, then this implies that the fundamental rights always presuppose their own horizontal effect by means of private law and the societal realms. 
At first glance, it seems a logical consequence of this observation that the horizontal effect of fundamental rights must be negated as a matter of principle. For if the substance of the fundamental right is itself represented in private law, then it seems that no room remains for any horizontal effect. And this conclusion has in fact been drawn in theory. But that conclusion would be false. Logically speaking, the fundamental rights imply their own horizontal effect only for the, what I call the normal case. This normal case is characterized on the one hand by the fact that the rights granted by private law have not yet been changed by contracts that include reduction of these original rights. And on the other hand, is characterized by the fact that no special circumstances are present in which the exercise of fundamental rights comes into conflict with rights of, with rights, other rights of financial interests protected in tort. The question that our discussion about horizontal effect is actually about is whether and to what extent a normative horizontal effect contradicts such deviations from the normal case. The paper then presents in short the relevant versions of doctrinal construction of the horizontal effect, which I skip now. It ends with the observation that the question whether fundamental rights do have effect in private law seems well settled from the point of view of constitutional law. But unfortunately, this finding has nothing to contribute to the question about the content, which fundamental rights, about the content that fundamental rights must um, have in private law. What is the content of the horizontal effect? And in my view, the key to understand the relevant content is to ask for the normative justification of the horizontal effect. From my philosophical perspective, the question about justification of the horizontal effect of fundamental rights has a specific meaning. The question is not about any normative justification, justification at all, which could even be, oh, fundamental rights are very, very important, and they are even more important than private law. This would be random. My question is whether the effect of fundamental rights can be justified with the same conceptual means which also form the basis of the justification of the provision of the private law. And my thesis is, in Nuce, the horizontal effect of fundamental rights in private law, as we know it, has an expressive rather than a constitutive function for private law. I start my argument with distinguishing three kinds of fundamental rights. The rights to non-discrimination, civil rights, and democratic rights. And each type of right has a different justification for its having a horizontal effect in a private law. As to non-discrimination rights, in order to understand them as inherent to the logic of private law, I refer to an argument recently articulated by Arthur Ripstein from Toronto. It basically says that discrimination in the areas of work, housing, or consumption goods would amount for those discriminated against to a factual deprivation of their freedom. Their case is similar to the case of those who have become poor due to the legal institutionalization of property rights as such. Just as for the, for the latter case, the state must support the poor through redistribution, through redistribution as an effect of the logic of private law itself, the state must inhibit discrimination in the sad cases, in the sad areas. In both cases, the state saves the purpose of private law, which is human freedom, against the effects of the very functioning of private law itself. With regard to civil rights, which include property rights, contractual autonomy, occupational freedom, I would like to keep this section rather short now because after rethinking the subject during the last days, I'm not very sure anymore whether there is indeed a relevant function for civil rights in private law. Um, I have some doubts whether an idea of contractual freedom as being bound in all parts by the request for substantive fairness, or if you like, contractual justice, which is an idea that I also try to defend, but not in this paper, I think it would justify similar results. However, if there is nevertheless a role to play for horizontal effect of civil rights, I would argue again that they serve to express the very purpose of private law, which is creating legal, equal legal freedom, and in this respect, um, the source of the horizontal effect is the logic of private law itself. Now I turn to the most interesting case, I suppose, the democratic fundamental rights. 
and this camp I lump all other rights, which is certainly contestable, but I don't argue for this at this point. In the case of democratic fundamental rights, the fundamental right specifies a particular action which is enabled, as I told before, by means of private law first and foremost, and grants precisely this action special protection. It would hence be wrong to say that the democratic fundamental rights merely express the purpose of private law as in the other cases. Because private law enables any sort of action, including action which does not enjoy special protection by fundamental rights. So this move cannot be made. Against the background of freedom of action constituted by private law, the point of the democratic fundamental rights is precisely to grant special status to a particular type of action, namely those which may have special significance in a democratic setting. For example, freedom of speech or whatsoever. In other words, a justification of the effect of these fundamental rights, which is internal to private law, must indicate why it is precisely democratic action that is granted a special status by being guaranteed in the form of horizontally effective democratic fundamental rights. And in my view, the justification of the effect of democratic fundamental rights lies in the fact that the democratic order is a condition for legitimizing private law. The relevance of legitimation does not itself stem from the fact that private law, just any other law, is also law which involves coercion. No, this would not be enough for my purposes. More specifically, if I want to involve the logic of private law, it is precisely private law as private law is dependent on being embedded in a democratic order. You see. <laughs> This stems from the fact that private law demands the public authority of its laws. After all, the logical origin of private law is the law, as the law constitutive to freedom lies in property. This is the old Kantian story. Its original emerging is by means of first occupancy. The first occupancy of an object, however, is a unilateral act which at the same time imposes obligations on everyone else not to touch it anymore. This unilateral obligation by means of a unilateral act can endure only if this is authorized by an omnilateral will. And this omnilateral will is represented in Kant's story by the state. And ideally, the state must generate the omnilateral will by means of the democratic process. The formal democratic process in form of free elections, parliamentary lawmaking, etc., however, itself rests upon a democratically structured society which is characterized precisely by a societal realization of democratic freedoms, such as freedom of speech and communication, the press, etc. In this sense, political democracy requires democratic sociality. In German, it's nice, it's demokratische Gesellschaftlichkeit. In this respect, private law would undermine its own basis of legitimation if it were to permit private law means to undermine this democratic sociality. In this regard, the democratic fundamental rights characterize those structures which are relevant for the legitimation of private law. Precisely for this reason, the democratic fundamental rights must become effective in private law based on the logic of private law itself. Now I conclude my argument. In their traditional function, the fundamental rights secure institutions and potentialities for action constituted according to private law against state interventions. Within private law, in contrast, they do not develop a constitutive function, but an expressive one. The fundamental rights explain the purpose and the basis for legitimation of private law. To be precise, civil freedom as the purpose and democratic freedom as a legitimation of private law. Purpose and legitimation come into play not only when fundamental rights are actually part of valid constitutional law. Rather, the fundamental rights express the constitutional character always inherent to private law. In this respect, the discovery of the effect of fundamental rights in private law does not imply a constitutionalization of private law. Private law itself has a constitutional character. Private law is free and democratic societal constitution. This character is a societal constitution, however, and this must be emphasized as a difference to Teutner's ideas about civil constitutions beyond the state, 
pertains only to that part of private law, valid as law, and not, for example, to complex contractual agreements, even if they may have developed an auto constitutional character. I turn to an example. The democratic substance of private law has been fully developed, hasn't been fully developed to date. The democratization of private law has yet to come about. And this time it is not about the democratic genesis of private law norms, but about enriching the basic private law norms in conflict towards and property with democratic substance via a reception of the substance of the fundamental rights. In other words, it is about a democratization of the substance of private law. Now, I would like to explain the effects briefly of such a substantial democratization of private law using the example of cooperation agreements between universities and industry. At present, the German public is debating a contract between the University of Cologne and the pharmaceutical company Bayer. The only thing known about this contract is that it provides for research cooperation between the corporation and the university with financial support from Bayer and in return privileged access to the research findings generated with these monies. It is not known whether the agreement includes limitations on academic freedom, for example, Bayer's right to influence the research process substantially, or even to keep unwelcome research findings confidential. The contract, after all, is secret. At present, efforts are underway by the administrative courts to obtain the publication of the contract, but it is not clear whether this will have success. To illustrate my idea, let us shift this case a little bit further into the realm of private law by imagining a private university instead of a University of Cologne. How would private law have to reflect academic freedom when considering a confidential cooperation agreement about research services? First of all, the contract, if it did in fact include the limitation of academic freedom, would be unconscionable and therefore null and void. Balancing academic freedom with the contractual freedom of the two parties, which is a paradigm of this balancing enterprise of private law all the time, would like uh, is, is not the place here. Um, it must not take place. Limiting academic freedom is beyond the scope of the two parties' contractual power. As a consequence, the invalid contract cannot develop any basis for duties arising from the employed professor's comp employment contracts. Furthermore, the protection of academic freedom must have an effect in advance. It must apply even to the confidentiality of the contract. The non-disclosure requirement pertaining to the contents of the cooperation agreement is itself to be considered a violation of academic freedom. So for this reason, the relevant clause of the contract is unconscionable and therefore void. However, the constellation of interest on the part of the professors and academic staff members who are in the position to sue or to claim uh, insight into the contract is apt to be systematically biased due to the services provided in turn by the company. Now, is it possible to construe rights for outsiders to inspect the cooperation agreement based on private law? Could, for example, a student or a citizen file suit against both contractual partners to seize and desist disturbing academic freedom? Anyone who considers this a stretch of categories of private law, and I admit that I would tend to adopt this position, would have to call on the legislators. Similar to the law of unfair co competition or consumer protection, special bodies would have to be granted the appropriate standing to sue in order to support academic freedom, extending also to the privatized part of university research. Now, I conclude with a very brief remark on fundamental rights in transnational private legal relations, understood as the infrastructure of transnational social constitutionalism. As I said at the beginning, for traditional doctrine, the horizontal effect of fundamental rights is a matter of constitutional law. The transnational scope of constitutional law is, however, rather vague. This is true for the justification of state courts on transnational matters. For, sorry, this is true for the jurisdiction of state courts on transnational matters. It is even truer for international arbitration tribunals if they consider themselves not to be framed by any constitutional court in particular. The point that I'm finally able to make with regard to transnational legal relations is probably no surprise anymore. My claim was that fundamental rights express what is inherent to private law. If this is true, then it does not matter whether adjudication is exercised by state courts or arbitrators. It does not matter whether adjudication takes place in a constitutional framework. 
of a state. It does not matter whether private law, whether the private law applied is the law of a state or a kind of a state lex macatoria, because whenever private law is in place, it has to reflect its purpose and its legitimacy. Whenever private law is in place, it has to be articulated as if there was horizontal effect of fundamental law. Indeed, uh, an extremely interesting paper. We have one question, two, anyway, I'll set up already on it. Um, but if, we could, if we could start with Hans Lindahl, please. Thanks very much for this provocative paper. Um, I have one uh, clarificatory question. Is I'm puzzled why you would at all insist on um, trying to uh, have a relation of foundation in one direction or the other between fundamental rights and um, private law. You were a bit apodictic about that, and I'm puzzled why you would want to at all have that uh, uh, foundational relation in one way or the other, but that's a clarificatory question. My, my real question has to do, of course, as you would expect it, about the distinction between the public and the private which you use. Because for philosophers, at least, it would be always the case that the distinction between the public and the private is itself public. And this is quite <coughs> clear in the case of that uh, analysis that you offer of the emergence of property on page 12 of your paper. Uh, you say that there's a unilateral act of occupation of private property and uh, that has to be justified over time. I couldn't help but think of this wonderful, brilliant article which uh, uh, Christian will no doubt also have read uh, by our good friend Schmidt. Um, I think the title of it is uh, Nehmen, Teilen und Weiden. And what he says is, um, at the beginning of law is a, a, a Landnahme. You take the land, but you don't take the land as private property. You have to take land as a collective. And it's only in the process of constituting yourself as a collective, a Landnahme, that there's at all the possibility Germans would say, überhaupt, the possibility of making the distinction between the public and the private. Now, if you look at, and he actually refers to, to Kant's analysis and also refers to Hobbes. And so my question would be, well, isn't this precisely a very good example of the fact that private property is itself a form of public law? Uh, the first point. And the second point, you say that you want to uh, ground pub, uh, uh, private law in reason. But if it begins with a unilateral act, with an act of occupation, and in that sense, a landname of conquest, that like what happened with Latin America, is in principle no different to the Occupy Wall Street movement. Then, um, if there is no, no um, emergence of a collective that it does not involve an act of conquest in one way or another, then how could we at all say that property is really ever grounded completely in reason rather than an act that kicks off a form of rationality? And of course, your argument would be, well, over time, what we get is a constitutionalization of a process of an ever greater inclusiveness. I don't think that would work that way. For who would say that the only understanding of Landnahme that would be a, a, acceptable would be one that would introduce collective property. To continue insisting on a private property is precisely to deny the democratic roots of that Landnahme. Okay, right, Jonathan. Now, to the first, I, I may manage the first. Uh, why am I interested in the founding relationship? Um, well, I'm not, there's no, not, a, not a guiding interest starting beforehand, but um, I start with the observation that legal doctrine presents the question as if it was a big puzzle whether horizontal effect should apply or should not apply. If you go back to the discussion when it took place, for example, in Germany surrounding the famous Lüthor tile, it was presented as as if they were two different logical orders. And so the question was, we have to look in the con into the Constitution, what the Constitution says about the horizontal fact of fundamental rights. This is how it was presented, and this is how it is still thought, and, and, and um, how it is still presented until today in textbooks, dissertations, habitations, and so on and so forth. And now, why am I not satisfied with it? Because simply it's wrong. I mean, it's, it's, it's evidently wrong that 
the understanding of fundamental rights is not possible with that. So this is a very conceptual and, in my view, a philosophical move. If you understand our basic concepts and something is presented as basic, as being independent of private law, and if it's not true, then I'm saying, no, that's not right. The second, if I come to the um, effect of my approach, well, you see my interest hidden in the background. So I, I, I like the philosophical outcome because I can show that all the struggles that are um, made about the transnational effect of horizontal rights in autonomous private law ordering and so on, which, which um, uh, entails terrible uh, problems in legal doctrine to construct those horizontal effects is overcome if I say they are inherent to logic of private law. So this is my uh, price that I gain, but uh, uh, this is not the uh, driving interest, let's say. So uh, the public and private, well, this is, uh, of course, a difficult question. I should give a substantial, well, oh, that. If I could just sharpen the question, at the end of the day, aren't you, despite what you said at the beginning, offering a justification of bourgeois democracy? Well, say yes or no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No. No, because because my my general, as I say, as I say in the paper, my, my general, you may say that it doesn't work, but of course it's against my intention. I mean, this I should be very clear. I say, well, um, I I try to develop from this point of this starting point that private law um, has in, uh, inherent links first to substantive justice, so the whole story of private autonomy as a center of private law I do not buy, and second, it has an inherent, um, uh, it's inherent, it, it, inherent connection to social democracy as such. So I to, I'm totally agree with your idea that uh, the di division between public and private law is itself a public distinction, meaning that when it's a public decision and a democratic decision where to apply private law and where not to apply private law, and when, whether we want to modify private law, and whether we want to transform given private law categories in the way that uh, seem uh, apt for uh, democratic self legislation That is not what I'm aiming at. I'm not, uh, I'm reading this difference, not if this is my, the last sentence to this question. I'm reading the difference not as a normative prescription for the legislative process, not at all. It's a hermeneutical differentiation and yeah, to continue why this is relevant and why you cannot do without it, what is uh, I cannot do at the moment. Um, we, I wonder if, if I could just request that the questions are kept quite short. I'm, gonna, I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to break from the running order because uh, there's a, a, a lady in the audience who I think hasn't asked a question yet. So would you? Would you no, but I don't them? want to jump the line. No, no, no please do. The line so we've right. monopolised the questions all 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 the conference. Okay, um, Bianca Gardella Tedeschi, I'm professor of comparative law at University of Piemonte Orientale, which is not far from here. And uh, um, I really like your paper. I like the idea of putting private law at the center. And, uh, and, but I don't stand in the philosophical uh, part, nor in the society, the sociological part, I'm more in comparative law. And the reason why I really like the idea of putting private law back at the center in a way and take what comes from fundamental rights in private law is that it gives the society and people and individuals still the possibility of organizing themselves in autonomy. And uh, as one of our major legal historian and former judge of the Constitutional Court said, we are able to buy and sell without legisl the legislature teaching us what to do. In, in a way, I'm puzzled with the philosophical outcome because it's very nice to say, oh, it, I, I'm not worried by adjudication. Even though I share my room with a colleague from constitutional law, and it's so difficult to speak. It's really too difficult to speak together on the, on, on the same issues, that probably going back to a more uh, law and society approach, I just, I, I'm asking you, do you really think that it doesn't matter whether this 
democratic fundamental rights in private law are adjudicated in front of arbitrators, in front of constitutional courts, in front of normal uh, civil private law courts. That's basically my question. Uh, Thank no, you. No, no, not at all, but this is due to the self-understanding of these uh, arbitration courts. I mean, what I'm, I, first of all, I've, but part of the project in my research group is about uh, criticizing this arbitrationalization of uh, transnational and international law. And one of the strategies is to say, well, if we have instituted these um, uh, arbitration uh, regimes, what must be clear is that they do not apply a different and autonomous law. They have to apply the law which would have been applied by a state court. This is one of the general strategies, though I, sociologically or politically, I fully agree with you that the outcomes will, for the time being, given that they don't have public office, but their private arbitrators will still be different, and uh, that this is a serious problem, of course. I, I, I agree with this completely. Did you, did you have a question? I need a question. We have time two more. I have great sympathy for this impressive endeavor to declare. Christian, would you listen? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> declare private law itself to, as the constitution of, of society, as opposed to the constitution of, of the state. and. I mean, if you look back, Code Napoleon was, in the sense, the the constitution of the societal part of society, as opposed to the constitution as the public part. And so there's a lot of sense to it. My problem is, has rather to do with your father, Immanuel Kant, and, and it's bad, bad sociology uh, in, in, in two aspects. I mean, one is the individual-based thing of private law, which you, I think, still adhere to. And, and here we have not only the problems with corporations and collectives in their own right, but even more with what Gauto has called the structural violence in within society and its identification within the Kantian approach, which I think is not, not possible at all. Second problem uh, is, has to do with the question, the unity of private law, uh, which is supposed in your thinking, which has as its constitutional subject the unity of society of the private individuals. And I think this unity is lost in both aspects, especially because you, in a sense, you have lost your constitutional subject of private law, and at the same time, in the, in the same time, the unity of private law. So this, there, I think, are the two, the two flaws of the Kantian approach. Um, as to the first part, it is, uh, I can only give a vague answer because I, am, I think that it is true that this is, you may, this is at least a characteristic of the idea that, the, um, that this is based on kind of a normative individualism. But I think it's, if, I, but I, I think what you, if, if you understand your remark is a criticism of mine, then you must think that there is, there is no logical priority of the idea of the individual and of, of the individual and of the individual's freedom in your sociology, and uh, this might be the case, but this might be vice versa than a point of criticism from my own part, as um, I think I can very very well cope with many problems that you're raising with still claiming that this is still at the basis, at the conceptual and at the moral basis, is still the individual and its freedom. So this is a of course, this refer, uh, requires much deeper discussion. And the bit of shall I? Yeah. Sure. yeah, with the question of the unity of society, I'm I'm not so sure about this because uh, the private law applies. Oh, it's a universal law in contrast to the political constitution, and this is why it is always already the law of the world society and it has the radical semantics with it because the radical equality in private law is already spread all over the world though there is given this fragmentation asymmetries which comes from the fragmentation the political fragmentation of the world in state politics and this is let's say a utopian um, 
idea which is represented in product law. So I um, think, yeah, I, I can avoid this criticism. <laughs> Very good. Um, okay, we have uh, two more questions and um, five minutes. Anybody else? Okay. Yeah, um, really fascinating paper. I, I, I really like the philosophical argument too, as you put it, that continuity between fundamental rights and private law, especially I think because it avoids what you also refer to as the, 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 the mess of the balancing, the arguments about yeah. proportionality contractual freedom versus academic freedom, the Nordic model versus the right of entrepreneurs to reflag their ships. You know, there's a lot of... Yeah, um, different, so. <laughs> Yeah, but I was wondering, just one question though. If, as you can see, the democratization of private law is imperfect, let us say, mm -hmm. yeah? it's yet to come. And if there are these biases, um, in the example of the co-opted university, you know, the sort of idea that who has locus standing? Who has, who has a legitimate interest? Do the students have a legitimate interest to interfere, interfere in the contract? So all these, given these structural and procedural biases, does it make, you know, politically speaking, strategically speaking, does, does it make sense to stress the continuity? Do we sometimes want fundamental rights to be used as a corrective private law distributions. Yeah, does it make some sense to sometimes use it as a collective? As, as a corrective? Yeah, strategically to say. Well, um, I'm, I'm not saying that um, the results, first I should maybe clarify that I'm not saying that privatization of these kinds of uh, societal functions as production of um, knowledge, for example, is without any problem because private law has so many good tools to cope with the problems. So indeed, that we, we, we have to look for someone who, has, who, has, who is able to claim a right is a weakness of privatization. And not, but, not, but the issue, so this is why I don't claim that um, they're really functionally equivalent whether we uh, run universities in the public law sector or in private law. All I'm claiming is that we don't have, thank you really very much for emphasizing this aspect, we don't have to, as is the prevailing doctrine, we don't have to balance all um, um, imperatives coming from horizontal effect of fundamental rights against the all overwhelming private autonomy element which is present in contract law and then we balance and then there's always enough weight given on, on, on private autonomy. This is the structure is um, uh, secures this uh, asymmetry on the side of private autonomy and property rights. And well, this is not a conclusive on a question to your answer, but uh, this is all I, I tell, I'm, I'm, I'm about to do. So, I, yeah. Final question, please. So, I mean, as I said, of course, about the difference. horizontal effect. When do we know? that constitutional rights apply to private sphere. And I'm wondering if functional differentiation could give us an entry point to that answer. In the sense that you were looking for the reason, an example of that private university. I can think of other examples. To the extent that that particular event or communication or claim can be established to have relevance to the function of that particular system, you can bring in the horizontal effect. If not, that becomes a matter that the state cannot intervene. I'm just wondering what your take is on that. Also, the, qu the question between the distinction you made in Can you just take this, the first question? I'm so sorry. Is that, I, re I really hate to be rude. Well, I'm, I, have, I, I have to think about it. Okay. Thank you very much indeed.